Welcome everyone. Uh, I'm Guido Molinari, Managing Partner at Prism Group, and it's my true pleasure today to present the enterprise solution with Amazon uh, block, uh, Managed Blockchain, uh, the case of S2RE by Legal and General Reinsurance. Um, uh, we have three speakers here today. Uh, Niar Modi, who's part of the manager at Amazon Managed Blockchain AWS. Maggie Su, who's global business de uh, development at uh, Amazon Managed Blockchain by AWS and Thomas Olunyolo, who is CEO at Legal and General Reinsurance. Welcome, Nihar. Thanks, Guido. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Nihar Modi. I lead product management for Amazon Managed Blockchain. I also have Maggie Shu, who heads uh, business development for Amazon Managed Blockchain. And today, we are going to give you an overview of the service and uh, also talk about some really cool customer use cases. So what is Amazon Managed Blockchain? So Amazon Managed Blockchain is a fully managed service that makes it easy for customers to create and manage scalable blockchain networks. Uh, we support open source frameworks. Today we support Hyperledger Fabric and uh, Ethereum is coming soon. So before we get into some of the features of Amazon Managed Blockchain, I wanted to discuss some of the challenges uh, that existing blockchain solutions face. And this is basically taking feedback from a lot of different customer discussions that we've had over the last few years. Uh, the number one that keeps coming up for customers is that setup is extremely hard. So a lot of customers tell us that they have to stitch a lot of infrastructure together to basically even get started. Uh, the second pain point that uh, we hear a lot is that it's hard to scale blockchain solutions, right? So if you think about a blockchain network, you've got multiple members that are participating in a blockchain network. And uh, just doing that at scale is, is really hard. The third pain point that we hear a lot is that it's complicated to manage. So think about solutions or problems like security. Think about other problems such as how are you gonna define the governance model or like how is the billing construct gonna work? And all of these uh, entities do add more complications when it comes to managing blockchain networks. And the third uh, and the last one that I would say comes up quite a bit is that it's really expensive. A lot of customers give us feedback that they spend a lot of money with expensive consultants or just in development effort to even get a POC going. Uh, and so these are the four really big challenges that exist today with blockchain solutions. So what are some of the features that Amazon Managed Blockchain offers to help solve for some of these pain points, right? So the first one and probably the most important one is that it's a fully managed service. And what this really means is that customers can create a blockchain network in minutes, right? There's no longer that uh, use case where you're spending weeks or months trying to get a blockchain network off the ground. The second feature is we support open source variety. Uh, so today we have support for Hyperledger Fabric and then Ethereum is coming soon. The third one is that it's actually decentralized. And what that means is that we've actually built features to democratically govern the network, which is when you wanna add new members, like how do you do that by a democratic process? The fourth one is that it's reliable and scalable. And what this means is we are using the same technology that powers Amazon QLDB to add more reliability to the solution. The fifth one, and something that matters a lot to customers is that it's a low cost solution. And what that really means is that customers pay for the resources that they're using. And the last one I would say is that uh, it's a highly integrated solution which means that customers can easily integrate with other AWS services such as CloudFormation or CloudWatch metrics or CloudWatch logs. And these are some other features that uh, Amazon and AWS customers like a lot. So how does Amazon manage blockchain really work? Um, so the first step is for customers to come in and uh, create a network and they can easily do this via the CLI or the AWS SDK. And essentially once you, uh, you know, give a command to create a new network within just a few clicks and a few minutes, a network is created. 
once you do this, you can programmatically invite other members to join the network. Um, and once you've got a network which has multiple members, members can essentially add their new peer nodes and peer nodes is where a copy of the ledger is stored. And we offer multiple options in terms of different sizes of peer nodes, depending on customers' workloads and uh, actual application. And once you've got this set up, customers can start writing their smart contracts and working on their applications, which is what customers really want to do. So if you talk to any customer that uses Amazon Managed Blockchain, they'll tell you that they can get to step number four within minutes, which is what the value prop of the service is. Lastly, I wanted to touch up on the pricing dimensions of this service. It's, um, it's really important because a lot of customers have given us feedback that uh, running blockchain POC is really expensive for them. So we've come up with a model, which is really a pay as you go model with no upfront cost. And if you look at it, there are four different pricing dimensions, right? The first one is network membership. So you're only billed if you're part of a network. If you're no longer a member in a network, you're not billed for it. There's a data written component. So this is all the data that you write into the blockchain ledger. And then there's the node that you have or host, which is the peer node, which is charged on a per hour basis. And then there's the node storage. And this is essentially the ledger size as your, as your uh, ledger size increases, your node storage increases, and that's exactly what you'll be billed for. Now I'd like to hand this over to Maggie to uh, run us through some customer use cases. Thanks, Nihar. Hi, everyone. I'm Maggie Shu, Business Development Lead for Amazon Managed Blockchain. I'll be sharing a few customer use cases with you, and then you'll hear from one of our customers directly. Nestle uses Managed Blockchain to track single origin coffee from farm to consumer under the brand Chain of Origin. You can see here a bag of coffee with a QR code. That scanned shows a record of all the touch points that went into making that bag. Not only does this benefit Nestle and the consumer, but the farmers are also able to directly track their output and get paid more efficiently. Another customer, Contura Energy, is using managed blockchain to process letters of credit. These are letters produced by banks that enable trading of large commodity shipments. This process is extremely manual and slow today, so by using blockchain, Contura is able to speed this process up. Singapore Exchange uses managed blockchain to help settle transactions instantly without intermediaries. This not only reduces costs, but also brings transparency to the data. And finally, Sony Music uses managed blockchain for digital rights management of music rights. Participants in the network can automatically verify the rights generation of any piece of work. Sony has actually seen a 75% reduction in ongoing costs on managed blockchain as compared to running a self-managed network. Here's how to learn more and connect with our team. And now I'd like to hand it over to Thomas Olanoyo from Legal & General to share more about how they're using Managed Blockchain. Thank you, Maggie. And hello, everybody. My name is Thomas Olanoyo. I am the CEO of a company called Legal & General Reinsurance. We are a global reinsurance business, which means we provide insurance to other insurance companies. So you can think of us as the last line of defense in insurance. We are a specialist in what is called pension risk transfer, which means that we insure pensions from around the world and we guarantee those payments for the long term to the millions of people who receive them over their lifetime. I'm talking today about our quite powerful blockchain use case uh, in partnership with AMB. So our company, Legal, Legal and General Reinsurance, manages over $25 billion of pensions, which sounds like a lot, but is really just a drop in the enormous ocean that is the global pension system, which has a value in the trillions of dollars and covers many hundreds of millions of lives. There are therefore, they're very, therefore very important and almost everyone listening today will at some point be receiving a pension. And when you do, I'm quite sure that you would want to know that you'll be paid the right pension at the right time. So, what is the most important question when it comes to pensions? It is, of course, who? Who should be paid and who should be paid right now? There are almost 200 million people in the US, the UK, and Canada, which are the markets we cover, receiving a pension, and we need to know who they are. Over the past two years, we have developed Estuary, working with our partners at Amazon to answer this question. 
Estuary is our blockchain solution for the management of pensions, and I'm very excited to tell you more about it today. Now, this is clearly critical because so many people rely on pensions as a retirement income, and the current pandemic really shines a light on the importance of taking care of our seniors. There are four problems that need to be solved in pensions to allow them to be managed with accuracy and confidence. I will describe each one of these problems and how blockchain are not just a great solution, but the perfect solution. I believe that blockchain can and should be the technology on which all pensions are managed in the long term around the world. And with AMD, we hope to make this a reality. The first problem is the existence problem. Quite frankly, who is alive right now? That's the foundation of any pension. Millions of dollars are paid each year to people who have already passed away. That is millions in waste that ultimately go back, should go back into the system to make it stronger for our parents, our grandparents, and eventually for us. Now, this might be hard to believe, however, but letters are still written to people to confirm if they're alive. And that determines if they get paid or not. This clearly should not be happening. And the technology exists to solve this problem. We solve this using blockchain by building a digital identity using data from all members of the network. Someone has the data or has access to the data. The problem is getting it around the network. With a blockchain and a mechanism for consensus, we are able to establish an existence with greater accuracy than has ever been possible and in real time. The second problem is what we call the population evolution problem. What has happened to the population over time? How has it changed? In addition to establishing existence right now, at a point in time, we also need to understand this existence over the history of the plan. So we're able to determine who we have paid in the past. A solution to this problem, along with a solution to the existence problem, will allow us to definitively change the way we think of a population of retirees. A blockchain, by definition, solves the population evolution problem by building that perfect history through consensus that is immutable. We can rewind the clock to understand the population at any point in time and to identify when there was a change. It adds another dimension to how we view and understand this data. This temporal element that is enabled by a blockchain is one of the key ways to transforming the pensions landscape worldwide. Let's move on now to the third problem, which is what we call the transparency or consistency problem. This is the problem that arises because the pensions ecosystem is so very fragmented. There are multiple parties involved and all providing services that enable the pension to be paid. Now, wouldn't it be great or even just expected that everyone in the network has the same data? You're probably already guessing this, but that is not the case. What you have is a very messy soup of different versions shared between parties by email or data rooms so that everyone can be working on a different data set and no one actually has the right data because it is inherently out of date given the limitation in the underlying current technology. The way to solve this is to put a distributed ledger between the parties and all these issues and additional ones that grow from them evaporate. With a blockchain, everyone sees the same data and everyone can do what they have to do consistently. And because you have solved the existence and the population evolution problem we mentioned before, you know that the data is live, it's real time, and you don't have to second guess whether the right decisions are being made. And in this case, whether people are being paid the right amount of money. Now, I hope it is increasingly clear why blockchain should be the foundation of the global pension system. Now, if these three reasons are not enough, I will give you one more and I'll end my presentation there. Insurers and reinsurers like ourselves play an increasingly important role in the pensions landscape. This is because of what we call buyouts or closeouts, which is when we provide insurance for pensions. So we effectively replace what is a, what is a promise from an employer or what is the hope that markets perform if you have a 401k, for example, uh, with an insurance guarantee. We write an insurance contract that can last over 50 years. To provide that insurance, we need good data. 
And of course, we rarely have that. We get bad data often with errors and have to go through a process of data cleansing, which can last many months or even years in extreme situations where we continue working with wrong data, with bad data. This means that we make assumptions and add costs to these transactions, which are in the many billions of dollars in size. Assumptions that inevitably make this more expensive and add uncertainty where there should be nothing but cost certainty. We are therefore the final link in the chain, the final destination and the ultimate home for pensions. We want to get it right. We want to ensure that we ensure the right benefits. We want to provide the most cast iron guarantee possible. To do this, we need great data that is validated and traceable. We need a solution for managing pensions risk. What we need is a blockchain. Now, I hope I've been able to communicate the magnitude of the problem and just how effective blockchains are in, in solving them. The network we are building is therefore one that has the potential to be quite vast, spanning the thousands of pension plans around the world and covering hundreds of millions of people uh, with financial institutions, including banks, insurance companies, asset managers, and everyone else involved in the management of pensions. AMB provides a unique proposition that is built for scale. As AWS is already widely used around the world, it also reduces a key barrier to access that may otherwise exist. Changing the world in any way requires collaboration. With AMB, we believe we have the right partner to transform the management of pensions and ultimately hundreds of millions of lives. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas, uh, for this great presentation. Um, so in the remaining few minutes, I have a, you know, a few questions for you. Um, the first one, of course, you, you addressed in your ending. You, know, um, you chose, of course, to develop with the Amazon Managed Blockchain team. And uh, you know, Nihar, in his presentation, presented some of the key advantages that they present. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about like, how was your selection process? Were there other considerations that you made? other you know, teams that you considered and how you ended up at the end choosing to work with the Amazon team? Yeah, absolutely. So, so we, we started our journey uh, trying to build our own network and our own infrastructure. And it soon became very clear that, uh, that it would be very costly and very time consuming. And we wanted and needed a partner that would allow us to build scale quickly. When we learned about AMB and we started talking to the AMB team, it just became very apparent to us at a very early stage that this was the right solution and the right partnership for us that allowed us to focus on solving the problem for our customer rather than building infrastructure um, that would inherently be not scalable, uh, but, but rather leveraging the uh, experience and scale and investment that Amazon has already made in this area. Very clear. And... Uh, you know, of course, there have been uh, other initiatives in the insurance and reinsurance space. Uh, you know, one name that comes to mind that I'm sure you've come across is the B3I consortium, right? That has, I think, uh, about 20 members, major insurance and reinsurance company. Have you guys uh, talked to B3I about uh, SRE? Are you planning to? Do you think of them as potential partners or competitors? That, that, that's, that's a great question. Now, we haven't had extensive discussions with B3I. Uh, we are focused very specifically on pensions. Now, I, uh, in the blockchain world, I don't view anyone as competition. I think by definition, we have to work together and we have to share ideas and we have to share technology. And I think we have to move away from thinking about technology in a proprietary way and, re and realize that it has to be more democratic in nature. So, so uh, to, answer you, to answer your question, I, I don't view them as competition, and I would love to collaborate with them at some point in the future, uh, because I think uh, they, they have great technology that, that would be uh, valuable to us, and hopefully we have the same. And, and I think to everyone in this space, we are very willing and very happy to share technology, because that's the only way that we can actually bring about the kind of change we're looking to achieve uh, in this space. There is, uh, you know, very much in the spirit, I think, of uh, blockchain technology and the industry we're in. Um, so in terms of the network that you're building, right, Thomas, uh, are there, you know, some players that you can already mention that will be, you know, joining the initiative? Are you guys 
thinking of structuring it as a consortium separate to legal and general insurance? What are sort of the next steps for Estuary going forward? All, all, all very great questions, and not very much I can say on that right now, as uh, lots of discussions are going on, as you can imagine, in the background. But, but my vision and my dream for blockchain and pensions is that it, it's used, of course, across the industry and around the world, uh, which would mean that no one can own it and no one should own it, uh, because that is not fundamentally what a DLT is. It has to be distributed by nature. Uh, so, so we are thinking about ways and trying to find ways to ensure that uh, that that could be the case. And it goes without saying, of course, that there's a certain inertia that arises because it's new and the pensions industry is hundreds of years old. So change will take time, but we hope to be catalysts uh, for that change. And I think working with AMB and other key partners, uh, I believe we can make that a reality. That, that is, uh, you know, a very inspiring thought. And, uh, you know, I'm sure there are other leaders in corporates listening today, and you in your position as CEO of um, Legal and General Insurance, what recommendation you have for other people in position of leadership that might want to push for, you know, an emerging technology like blockchain in the organization and get, you know, past the POC stage, which is where, you know, we've seen, unfortunately, a lot of these things are getting stuck. Yeah, that, that's a great question. I wonder that I talk about all the time. I think uh, someone once said to me, fall in love with the problem and not the solution. So, so uh, first of all, make sure that a blockchain or, or whatever other technology you're interested in is the right solution for your specific problem. And ultimately, if that is the case, then what you'll have is a very powerful solution that allows you to change your business. Um, where, where I've seen it fail, or perhaps not go beyond the POC phase, is because it's uh, the, the, the typical round peg in a square hole, or square peg in a round hole, um, you're trying to make something fit that doesn't fit. Uh, tech technology isn't, isn't in and of itself a solution. It's how you use it that's a solution. So make sure you have the right technology for the right problem and the right people who believe in it. Uh, I think ultimately uh, you, you need to have the people who understand technology embedded within the business and the people who understand the business embedded within your technology team. That really is the only way to bring about the kind of change and transformation that we are all looking for. Yeah, no, that is something that, again, we've seen um, looking at corporate that be more successful in the pushing forward the implementation where it was not just an initiative led by the innovation team on its own, but it was really built within the core business so that it could move forward and get the you know necessary internal approval to, to become a reality, really. Um, so uh, maybe, you know, one last departing uh, question, you know, as part of the conference Unitize, um, there has been a lot of talk about regulation, right? And of course, um, you know, pensions are something that goes across many countries, many different regulations. How do you see the approach of regulators to date about, you know, the type of initiative you've had, but in general, the idea of moving to a blockchain-based system for insurance and reinsurance products? Yeah, absolutely. So, so regulation is such a big part of our world. Obviously, we're in the insurance world, so we are heavily regulated, uh, not just in Bermuda, where we're based, but also in other jurisdictions as well. Um, so the, what we have done is we have engaged our regulators. So we've invited them in, we've demonstrated what we've done, and we've really helped them understand. I think we're all on this, on this journey together, really. And I think this, and this journey is one of increasing efficiency, and bringing down costs and finding the right solutions for the problems we have as an industry. Uh, if we see it or if you see it, uh, your regulators see it as well, right? So, so they, they are inherently supportive, I believe, of the kind of change that the right technology brings. Uh, what, what we cannot do, however, as an industry is, is step back from, from the processes that we have in terms of meeting our regulated demand. So we have to be transparent. We have to share with them the technology. We have to explain and demonstrate why we are comfortable. And we have to explain and, and, and demonstrate why this is the right solution. And I think once you get over that, that initial hurdle, uh, they, they will be bought in and be supportive, which is where we need to get to. Yeah, and you know, I think that reflects a lot of the conversation that have been happening during the conference and the idea that 
a regulator might also see the better transparency from their standpoint as an advantage, you know, compared to maybe a current system where they know their form of the fact after they've happened many days later. Um, so uh, one, you know, last question for you, Thomas. Um, you know, the, the, there have been a lot of discussion about permission network, and I know that, you know, S3 right now is a permission network with, you know, very non-participants, but many even corporate entities have talked about eventually, you know, some of the permission network moving to permissionless in the way that the internet started, you know, with local internet, they were all separate and it eventually merged on open internet. Do you foresee that for happening or is the world of, as you mentioned, insurance and insurance so regulated that, you know, a world where this would run on permissionless blockchain, it's not really foreseeable. What, what's, what is your view in terms of this? Yeah, that, that is a really great question and one that I don't have, have a, a great answer for you right now. But what I will say is that, uh, you know, I think ultimately the future is permissionlessness, is, is permissionless in some form. Uh, we have to find a way to make it more inclusive and, and to bring more, more, more people in. I think uh, localized permission networks have a powerful use. But ultimately, if we're able to harness the, the full power of, of blockchain and DLTs, uh, we have to go beyond that. Now, of course, there are regulatory questions and issues that we have to address, uh, uh, data protection being, being just one of them. And I think we need to find ways to solve those problems in a way that our regulators are comfortable with. Now, I think that is an inevitable journey. And that's, that's a question that we have to solve. Uh, I don't think there's any answers necessarily right now. But I'm sure that as we are, many, many clever people are working on this to ensure that we find a way to ad address those issues so we can allow this technology to achieve its fullest potential around the world. Thank you, Thomas. And, you know, I wish you the best for, for your journey uh, with this technology and to the Amazon blockchain team. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.